Well, I'm waiting for people to join the Zoom. Well, it doesn't look like they did. <laughs> Go ahead and take a seat. Not at all. Admit. Hey, Song, can you hear me? Uh oh, now it's not working. <laughs> Thanks. Let's share. No boxes. Great. Give it a minute or two. Sounds good. Outside with Teddy, probably. Ah, there she is. <laughs> You're gonna do a very good job. <laughs> Thanks. Okay, good morning everyone. Um, it, it is my great pleasure actually to host today's event. And uh, I'm very surreal to hear about Luke and Cece's defense. And Luke Kaluska joined my group about four and a half a year ago. And his topic is very diverse. His expertise, I'm for sure, are gone forever miss. He's like glue for every single technique we have ever touched in our lab. He's knowledgeable and dear to try any new technique. Your advice is that might be interesting. Let's give it a try. He will be always the first to say, I want to do it. And he always success. You will hear about some of the talk. They're going to introduce you many, many um, new exciting techniques he actually brought to the group. He's a prolific in in collaboration, in publication, I can always rely on Luke to start any new collaboration. For example, a lot of work Luke has been doing is through close collaboration with the University of Windsor, Purdue University, Imperial College in London, and more recently with the University of Kentucky. Um, I am very excited to hear Luke talk about some of his products. He won't have the time to talk every single of them, but he will talk I believe uh, three out of four projects he feels most excited about. And Luke's work is not only you know, recognized within my group, but he has been recognized within the department, within the American Chemical Society. 
he got several honors. I want to mention one is uh, particularly recently nominated to participate ACS Excellent in Graduate Polymer Research Symposium. It's a quite an honor that only some of the top students in the U.S. Um, polymer research got a chance to go and interact with other students. And he has won several poster awards as well. So uh, as you can see, American Conference on Neutron Scattering, uh, Center for Nano Phase Material Science and Engineering, etc. So he accomplished these. On the top of that, with a baby in graduate school <laughs> and in the middle of pandemic, that's just amazing to me. I would say you you totally exceeded my expectation, and I'm thrilled to hear all your nice words. Look. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you for that introduction, Dr. Gu, and thank all of you for being here. It's a surreal moment. Uh, so the topic of my dissertation today is the thermomechanics of semiconducting polymers and their morphological phenomena. Now this is a big, pretty broad topic, so let me give you some background. So semiconducting polymers are composed of two main components. The first is their conjugated backbone. This promotes charge transport. The second is their alkyl side chains, which promote solubility. These polymers are semi-crystalline in nature, and they have two modes of transport. The first is charge transport along the backbone. That's like a highway, fast, going 70 miles an hour. The second is between pi-pi stack units. This is like taking an exit. You have to have both to go any long distances. Now, at the device scale, these polymers are typically under 100 nanometers in thickness. And so due to this size scale, as well as their polymeric nature, they open up avenues for novel, mechanically novel, electronic applications, where we have electronics that are now ductile, flexible, even soft. And so specifically for technologies such as wearable or implantable um, electronics, it is uh, quite apparent for. Now, all of the applications you see here have mechanical novelty. Well, their mechanical novelty is not truly well understood, uh, and there is a wide range of reasons for that, but essentially they're quite complex. If we look at the structure processing properties for our polymer pyramid, we can change any part of the backbone, the side chain, functionality. We can process them in different ways, just film thickness, anneal them, how we cast them. And we have a range of properties from glass transition, crystalline packing, and all across the board. So it's quite complex, and part of that is just because previous research has been focused on charge transport, and now it's moving towards a focus on mechanical performance. Now, that's not to say there haven't been great leaps and bounds that have occurred for this field within mechanical performance. And I'm gonna give you some of the base guidelines before going into my work. So if we consider the backbone, we can change the backbone in a variety of ways. Uh, in one work by the Lipome group, uh, they introduced uh, a number of acceptor moieties, a number of donors, combined them together. And what they found is that as you increase the number of fused rings within your system, it gets stiffer. You lose conformational freedom, modulus goes up, and you embrittle your system. Okay? That's one of the general guidelines that occurs pretty much across the board. In our group, uh, Song, work by Song Zhang, uh, he explored a DPP-based polymer. He inserted increasing number of thiophenes or fused thiophene rings into the backbone. And what he found is that the modulus goes up due to an increase in backbone TG. And really the main reason for this is that as we incorporate these units into our backbone, we're diluting the response of the side chain, which acts as an internal plasticizer to our system, lowering the TG of the backbone. And so really, side chain plays a big role in these polymers. So as we increase the side chain content for a wide variety of conjugated polymers, TG of our backbone goes down. So in return, this leads to a softening effect and a lowering of the modulus. Now, besides modulus and softening, it's actually also been known to promote ductility. So work by the O'Connor group uh, actually found that the side chain TEG, also known as the beta transition, acts as a brittle to ductile transition temperature, right? So when you're above this side chain TEG, you're a ductile system. A great example of this is just regioregular P3HT. It has a backbone TG of about room temperature. It's quite ductile, oftentimes over 50 to 150% strain. But its side chain TG is anywhere between negative 80 and negative 100 degrees, so quite low. But it maintains its ductility until about negative 110. So it really exemplifies the side chain's impact on softness and ductility. 
Now, beyond structure, we have to think about molecular weight. Molecular weight is one of those pivotal uh, uh, parameters that govern pretty much all aspects of performance, whether it be electrical or um, mechanical. And the reason for this is as we increase molecular weight, we go from an isolated system that's, you know, uh, basically separate crystalline units, and as we increase, we eventually get a large number of entanglements and tie chains bridging crystalline domains. And it's really these tie chains and this connectivity that allows for force delocalization as well as delocalization of a charge. Now, I wasn't sure if I was going to give this analogy, but I'm going to do it anyways. So you can think of Red Rover, Red Rover. It's a childhood game. You have a bunch of kids holding hands. If they have a strong connection, then when the next kid runs at them, they're going to bend and move with that force, but they're not going to break. If they have a weak connection, then they're going to shatter like a highly crystalline system. Okay? Now, I just mentioned crystalline. That's a good thing to jump to. So if we consider P3HT, it's a semi-crystalline polymer, but when we change it to PB triple T, it becomes highly crystalline with large grain boundaries and crystalline domains of about 200 nanometers across. And so this is a phase image from AFM for that. But what we find is that as we go from this structure to the next, our modulus goes up due to this increasing content of stiff units, as well as ductility changes dramatically from above 150% to now below 2.5%. So what's going on here and why we must consider it is that adding crystallinity, especially crystalline perfection, robs our system of entanglements as well as the ability for connection between crystalline and crystalline domains. So we lose tie chain content. And so really we have to understand how all of these work together. So if we go back to this polymer pyramid, and I didn't discuss everything that's been done, that's not my goal, just to give you some general design rules. But if we change our structure, we of course change our properties. If we process it differently, such as annealing, we make crystallinity go up, so we no longer see what we initially saw. There's a wide variety of things that we can do to tune the mechanical performance. Now in my work, uh, I've tried to focus on pretty much each aspect of these. Part of this is just from interest. Uh, you know, I found something like Dr. Gu said and I said, let's go for it. Um, and that's kind of my personality. So for processing, we're gonna focus on thin film confinement today. As I mentioned, they're under 100 nanometers thick. So we have to know how that thickness regime uh, plays into our properties. And then we're gonna look at the role of the hydrogen bonds on the structure performance. And then for properties, we're going to look at the rigid amorphous fraction. Now for that work, we're gonna sidestep. We're not gonna focus on mechanics. We're actually gonna focus on charge transport and some novelty there. So the common link between these is really, even though they're separate projects, is that the morphological influence in all of these works dictates either mechanical performance or electrical performance. And hopefully you see that. So why care about confinement? Well, we have to care because at the size scale we're dealing with, at the device scale where they're gonna be used, is under 100 nanometers thick. And as we get thinner and thinner and thinner, that interface begins to play a dominant role. So if you're on something hard and stiff and you interact strongly, then you're gonna start to feel more stiff yourself. If you're on something mobile, you're gonna start becoming more mobile for that thin film. Additionally, as we get thinner and thinner, we have a geometric confinement that occurs. And this is where the end-to-end -end distance of the polymer is now greater than the thickness of the film. And so the film becomes oriented in the XY plane, it loses interentanglements, and we would expect from both of these potential change in modulus, and then from this effect, changes in yield stress or ductility. Now, we have to talk about polystyrene when we think of thin film confinement. And it's because it's the most widely studied polymer. And frankly, conjugated polymers are not that well studied in terms of confinement yet. And so we have to use this as a starting point for then we'll go into conjugated polymers. So uh, Song and I actually developed, a, or with Song Gu and I, and all actually wrote a review paper together. And this is actually a compilation of all the or not all, most of the, a lot of the prevalent work in TG on polystyrene, there's a ton of groups that go into this. Dr. Forrest, Dr. Connie Roth, uh, Dr. McKenna, I, I can't name them all for, uh, by any means. Um, but what I want to point out is that as we get thinner and thinner, our TG or our delta TG goes down. 
So we get, uh, for hard substrates, there's a relatively constant effect. For softer substrates like PDMS at a high base to cross linker ratio in the white circles, there's a strong effect. As well as an air which has two of these interfaces, right? This air film domain. And this can play a dramatic role. What I want to point out for air, for freestanding films, is that the reason we have this boundary right here is that it actually has been shown to be molecular weight dependent. Right? Where you have a high molecular weight system, you're going to have experience a more dramatic reduction in TG. Now, if we take this and we want to think about mechanics, we can apply the TGs we see here to kind of a classic DMA of polystyrene. And we can see what reductions we might expect, right? So for, we're going to focus on the air system here. If uh, we look at that from our boundaries, we can experience anywhere from a 10 to a 30% reduction in modules, okay? And really, polystyrene, with all the data from literature, offers a great avenue to first explore through mechanical phenomenon for thin films. Um, and we have to ask ourselves, well, what about the thin film mechanics? I haven't talked about that at all yet. Well, it's good to get a realistic picture of what we're dealing with. This is a human hair. Um, and it's about 60 to 80 microns thick. And the films we're dealing with are anywhere from 400 to 4,000 times thinner. So very thin, that's to scale. Uh, PowerPoint just drew a white line because it couldn't actually make the line. So it's very thin. Uh, in terms of measuring the mechanics, there's a number of ways, from nano indentation to a bunch of wrinkling techniques, whether it's on, a, uh, um, on PDMS or uh, on a water, as well as having a composite film where you laminate a film onto a PDMS and you stretch that and see where it begins to crack. Uh, but for our group, uh, we've primarily focused on this pseudo freestanding test where we float a film on water and we're able to perform a stress versus strain analysis of this film. Okay. But all of these techniques you see here rely on some type of substrate, whether it be hard, soft, liquid. And the problem with this is they're not always comparable. And so what we wanted to make is a method where we can have a freestanding film and be able to measure mechanics and understand the inherent properties of our film, as well as exploring some of that confinement influence. So what we did is we came up with the SMART technique, because we want to do it the smart way, not the hard way. Uh, Dr. Gu came up with the acronym. I've got to give him credit for that. Uh, so it's noted as Shear Motion Assisted Robust Transfer. And so what we're doing is we first can create a composite film. The film in orange is our film of interest. The uh, little green stuff is a water-soluble polymer called PSS. And we laser etch this film into a dog bone geometry. It has some side supports that we'll remove in the video. But we basically float this film onto a piece of silicon. It's connected to a motorized stage. We then connect the floated film to a linear stage, which will eventually provide displacement, a load cell which measures force. And what we do is we shear that stage out from underneath the thin film. And this is pretty much like, hey, you see in a movie, you have a tablecloth, there's dishes on it, and you yank the tablecloth out from under it, and the dishes remain. I've never been successful at that. Um, this is easier for me. Uh, so in the video, this is a 19 nanometer polystyrene film. Uh, so to date, as we know, this is currently the thinnest film that's been tested in this manner. Uh, so we first remove these side supports simply with a tweezer. You see how that works. This is the film. We stretch it. You're going to see uh, yielding and crazing occurring, followed by basically this ductile regime prior to crack initiation at the side. And then eventually this polystyrene film breaks, but quite ductile for something that's 19 nanometers thick. It's kind of crazy, especially when you think of bulk polystyrene and it's you know, quite brittle. So in this work, we're going to focus on polystyrene at a high molecular weight to test that uh, higher upper boundary for TG reduction, as well as P3HT. Now, P3HT is a soft viscoelastic polymer, and it's one of the standard conjugated polymers to study in literature. Now, what we're going to do is we're actually going to pair our freestanding method to the film on water method. So we want to explore both confinement influence as well as interface. And one of the main reasons for that is this film on water technique is prevalent throughout the study of semiconducting polymers. And that's why we want to explore it and know if does water have any influence. Additionally, we're going to further dive into that uh, interface with uh, quartz crystal microbalance and neutron reflectometry. So in this work, we were able to study for polystyrene films from 155 nanometers down to 19 nanometers thick. 
And what we found, and let me state this first, is that the black dots are the film on water technique, the red dots are the freestanding. For polystyrene, they're essentially equivalent. You don't need to uh, worry about it. What we need to do is look at the trend. And so as we go from a bulk state to a confined state, we actually don't see a big change in modulus. We only see that reduction when we get to our thinnest film of about 19 nanometers. While in contrast, if we compare what our expectation from TG, we would expect it to be around 2,000 for a 25 nanometer film. And actually for a 19 nanometer, it's actually supposed to be in the rubbery state. Um, now this is actually pretty interesting because one, it kind of challenges some existing literature data for polystyrene, but it also supports more recent literature that actually shows that vast molecular weight uh, uh, dependent property is actually only 10% of the contribution. The rest of the contribution actually mimics that of a supported film, okay? So it actually supports more recent literature. Additionally, if we look at yield stress, as we confine our film, the yield stress decreases. This is in line with a loss of interentanglements in our system. And additionally, as we confine our film, ductility or strain at failure increases until it hits a critical point where we've lost so many entanglements that it's just fragile. Uh, although, once again, it's still not too fragile, about 5% for the freestanding films. Now, when we think of the increase in ductility, we can think of it in two ways. One is we have this mobile surface on our film. It can provide some mobility to enhance the ductility. But also, our film is aligned in the XY plane, which may allow it to adopt conformations more readily in that state. Now, if we shift our attention to P3HT, this guy is soft. It is an order of magnitude uh, lower in modulus. Uh, so first off, we just wanted to know, can we even get a freestanding film? Uh, and then do the properties change? Well, the answer is yes. There's a picture of an 80 nanometer film. And what we found is that ductility was the biggest difference with the freestanding being lower. Uh, but in addition, we did find that the freestanding technique in red offered a higher modulus, about 6% higher or 20 megapascals. And what that's led us to believe is that the water may be plasticizing the P3HD to some extent. Additionally, if we look at the ductility or strain at failure, the freestanding is relatively stable from 80 to 100 nanometers, but as we increase the thickness for the film on water, its ductility goes down. And this leads us to believe that water is providing a crack mitigation mechanism where it's stabilizing that interface, just like a solid substrate would, but it's only doing this primarily for softer films. For stiffer films, it's not gonna be able to provide as much of that interaction. Now, what we wanted to do is confirm that, you know, water is indeed getting into our system and have the quantity and its effect. Because for the thickest film, that thickness uh, ductility went down, we expect that the water interface is playing less of a role because it's now thicker. So what we did is use quartz crystal microbalance with uh, a great help from our collaborators at CNMS at OR ORNL. And what this experiment does is we have a quartz crystal sandwiched between two electrodes. And quartz is a piezoelectric, so when we apply a voltage across it, it shears in the thickness direction and does so as a at a specific resonant frequency. And as we place a film on it and then water on it to flood that film and begin to uptake water, we actually begin to change that frequency. And it gives us information about mass uptake. And then we also are able to extract information about the softening effect. So delta F is the change in frequency um, and delta D is the energy dissipation. So as delta F decreases, we have an uptake in mass. As delta D increases, we have an increase in a softening influence. Now, you have a number of lines you see here. This is related to the harmonic number or the frequency that we're uh, basically subjecting this uh, film and quartz to. And it allows us to probe the depth uh, res uh, information. So at a low harmonic number, n equals one, we're probing that film water interface. As we get to a higher harmonic number, we're probing that crystal film interface. So what we found for poly, or excuse me, P3HT is what we're gonna focus on. In the dry state, the mass, there's no uptake, of course. As soon as we submerge it, it's instantaneous, and we have mass uptake. It primarily occurs at the interface, and then there's a gradient into the film. That's exactly what we would expect, because um, that's where water's in contact with it. Additionally, it also demonstrates that we have a softening at that interface, and then it pervades throughout the film as well. And this is great for us because it agrees that we should have plasticization occurring to some extent in our P3HT. 
Now, I'm not going to talk really about polystyrene, but essentially the results are identical, except that for polystyrene, if we consider the same type of reduction, like for P3HT, 20 megapascals, we would never see that in a tensile experiment because it's within our uh, error boundaries. So next we wanted to actually quantify this uptake with neutron reflectometry. And once again, a big shout out to our collaborators at SNS ORNL. Uh, I was able to run this instrument, but they basically held my hand the whole way. So it was great. Um, really fun people as well. So in this experiment, we have a neutron beam and we are uh, subjecting a film that's uh, placed onto a water bath. And then we're looking at the reflected beam and the ratio between those two. And so what we get is information on thickness, roughness, and a density profile throughout the thickness direction. And so what we achieve is a reflectivity versus Q plot. So Q is a size scale, right? At low Q, we have large structure. At small, yeah, at large Q, we have, excuse me, at high Q, we have small structure. At low Q, we have large structures. And the blue is from the water. It's kind of the baseline. Um, and basically, the fringes, or the distance between these fringes, allow us to calculate thickness. And then the SLD, which is the scattering length density, gives us contrast. Okay? And so as we are above the line for the water, we actually have a higher SLD. Uh, than the water. And so eventually as we get swollen with water, we expect our SLD to mo look more and more like water itself. And this is a picture of what we did. So this is a P3HT film about 50 nanometers thick and about five by five centimeters. So quite large, uh, but it was a pretty fun experiment. And so this is our reflectivity data essentially to keep it short. For P3HT at 109 nanometers, there is very little water uptake, about 1.2%, pretty much agreeing with our tensile data. At 36 nanometers, it was 9.1%. So of course that increases as our interface begins to play a more dominant and dominant role. For the scattering length density, this is actually our density profile from air, our film, scattering length density decreases for our film as it gets thinner, and our water. And so basically we're able to calculate X, which is our volume fraction of water in our film, from the dry SLD of P3HT and pure water and the experimentally determined SLD of the film. Now what this work shows is that one, water we're believing is primarily lying within voids throughout the film because it's not plasticizing P3HT to a great extent, but also it's not plasticizing polystyrene much at all, even though polystyrene also has this same trend in water uptake. And so further, we believe that water uptake is increasing the strain at failure, especially due to this interfacial effect. So in summary, uh, in this work, we developed a method to characterize films as low as uh, 19 nanometers. And specifically, we were able to look at the role of confinement on modulus and all mechanics, as well as the role of the interface. Now let's go back to this polymer pyramid. So we've covered one part, processing. Next is we're going to look at hydrogen bonding. So why care about hydrogen bonding? Well, there's two main reasons. One is it can provide energy dissipation through non-covalent crosslinks. Uh, a lot of this work has been done by the Bauer Research Group and really great results for that. Uh, the other side is that it offers morphology control and it can actually impart increased crystallinity to the system potentially or potentially uh, disrupt it. So what we have to question is which dominates because higher crystallinity is negative for mechanics while energy dissipation is positive. So what we did with our help of collaborators at Windsor University, we looked at a DPP-based polymer where we have a statistical copolymer. And what we did is the, the pure polymer has these branched side chains. And then we insert a, either a linear component of C12, H25, or we have a side chain that's amide functionalized or urea functionalized. And so the idea is we're increasing hydrogen bond strength. We want to know how it interacts with our system. And so some key questions. How does hydrogen bonding strength influence mechanical performance? Does the morphology play a vital role? And then what about the measurement environment? Because we're perfectly introducing, uh, per we are purposefully introducing hydrogen bonds into the system. And so we could be potentially plasticizing ourselves if we use the techniques I've talked about. Well, we're actually going to do that on purpose and we're going to see some neat things. So what we do is we actually look at the freestanding method where we have less water contact, although we use water to get to that uh, state. We have our normal film on water method. And then we're going to purposely expose our film for 24 hours and see what can tell us about 
the hydrogen bonding. So to start the film on water measurement, uh, what I really want to focus on is for modulus between these four polymers, there's not a huge difference. However, if we look at ductility, there's a profound difference. The DPP amide uh, actually increased by 100% relative to the pure branch, while urea decreased by half. So a profound difference. But we have to ask ourselves, urea has greater hydrogen bonding potential, and so what's actually at play here? So if we look at our 24-hour water exposure measurement, what we found is that all of our film, films were plasticized to some extent. And DPP amide to the greatest extent, about uh, just above 350 to just below 250 megapascals. Well, in comparison, DPP urea actually did not plasticize as significantly despite this greater hydrogen bonding interaction. So we would normally expect water's coming into our system, it's gonna disrupt hydrogen bonds. So what we have to ask ourselves is, is crystallinity a role? Is the DPP urea exhibiting higher crystallinity and thus shielding the urea functionality? Now, if we look at strain at failure, that's also very telling, because what it tells us is that the DPP amide and urea do not exhibit really much of a difference at all between the normal measurement and 24 hours. And what we would expect is that if energy dissipation was playing a big role, we would expect water to actually be interfering with that, disrupting that interaction, and ductility to go down. But that wasn't the case. So it kind of points us towards crystallinity once again. So we also looked at our freestanding measurement. Really, I, all I wanted to point out with this is that the freestanding and the film on water have essentially identical modulus. So under short time scales, we're not plasticizing the film substantially. Now, we further looked at the swelling behavior of these films to kind of quantify some of this plasticization influence. And we used a, um, spectroscopic lipsometry in a liquid cell. So essentially, we look at the dry film first. We compare our linearly polarized light to the exiting elliptically polarized light. And then we flood our sample and we want to see how thickness changes. And so for the DPP amide, thickness doesn't change a lot. Uh, about only 10 angstroms, so just a little bit of that. But it eventually stabilizes over 24 hours. However, if we look at the percent swelling for all the films, it actually is quite telling. So for the branched film in black, uh, we have the lowest degree of swelling, it's the slowest. The linear counterpart in green, it's a bit more, which is expected because we're decreasing the alkyl content of our film. For the blue, we have the highest degree of swelling uh, for the DPP amide, uh, which is agreeing with our mechanical results for plasticization. And the red is from DPP urea. And that's quite cool, because it swells like that. It's very quick, very qu immediate. Uh, but then it plateaus also very quickly. So what this tells us is that for any urea groups that are available for the water, they're plasticized immediately, essentially. Uh, but the system is so crystalline that it's then shielding the next uh, urea groups that were within crystalline domains, and thus we see this plateau. Now, I've talked about crystallinity. It would be great if I actually showed you something about crystallinity. <laughs> so what we did is we did grazing incidence, wide angle uh, x-ray scattering. And essentially, the synopsis is that DPP amide has a lower crystallinity than uh, all the other polymers, while DPP urea is significantly higher. And so this is the relative degree of crystallinity. We actually get it from the alkyl stacking peak. Uh, and we normalize it based off our branch TVT polymer as one, and we see that the DPP urea is significantly higher and DPP amide is significantly lower. So big crystalline uh, difference for our morphology. But luckily, this actually agrees perfectly with our strain at failure data, where DPP urea exhibiting the highest crystallinity exhibited the lowest strain at failure, and in contrast, DPP amide with the lowest crystallinity had significantly higher strain at failure. So this leads us to suppose that the crystallinity of, or the hydrogen bonding influence on morphology is dictating performance rather than through energy dissipation. Now, we also have to look at the electrical properties. So what we did is we created a uh, OFET device and what we're doing is we're laminating a film on PDMS, we stretch that film, and then we place it on our OFET device and measure the performance. And so what we found is that DPP amide actually has relatively stable charge transport while DPP urea decays substantially, uh, pretty much immediately. And this is in regard to our mechanical results where we expect it to decay. And so I've talked about the role of crystallinity. We, it's a thief, it robs entanglements uh, from our system. 
And so one of the thoughts is that the system is not interconnected enough, so as soon as we apply a strain, we're breaking any connection it has, and so charge mobility decays drastically. So in summary of this work, uh, we demonstrated that crystalline packing appears to be one of the dominant mechanisms rather than energy dissipation. In this case, that is not always the case. And that hydrogen bonding strength is not the best uh, thing to look at because just simply increasing hydrogen bonding strength does not mean you're going to have greater energy dissipation. You could have greater crystallinity as in this case. So now we're going to look at uh, the last project. Uh, so this uh, rigid amorphous section. And I'm good on time. Great. Uh, so for this Richard Amorphous Fraction project, it was kind of out of the blue. So I have to thank our department for getting our awesome uh, spectroscopic ellipsometer. I've had a lot of fun with this tool. Uh, it's not run by our group, but I pretty much stole it in terms of time. Uh, <laughs> so the Richard Amorphous Fraction is quite interesting. Let me tell you about it. So the rigid amorphous fraction is an amorphous domain that interacts strongly with the crystalline domain. And so you can think of it as chains exiting the crystalline domain, chains very much adjacent to the crystalline domain, or tie chains as well. So a tie chain, by definition, is at least part of this rigid amorphous fraction. Okay? Now one of the great things about this is that the crystalline interaction actually restricts the conformational freedom of this raft domain. And so what you get is you get a thermal transition between the TG of the mobile amorphous fraction, which has no interaction with the crystalline domain, and that of the melting temperature of the polymer. So you get an amorphous domain that has higher stability. Now if we look at conventional semi-crystalline polymers, I could give you a big table, we don't care about it, we only care about the polymers. Um, and within this group is a large range of uh, polymers, you know, from PET, nylon, PoE, uh, and pretty much what past work has suggested, all semi-crystalline polymers essentially possess a rigid amorphous fraction. And it typically lies between the TG of the ba a normal backbone and the TM of the crystalline domain. So for uh, for conjugated polymers or semiconducting polymers, we should expect that it's there, right? But this is actually quite hard to achieve. Uh, so typically, we would do modulated DSC to look at the RAF domain. But if we just consider just general DSC for conjugated polymers, uh, especially the rigid ones, donor acceptor polymers, DPPT, NDI, uh, they do not have a significant change in their specific heat capacity across that TG. So essentially, we can't use this technique. And if we look at more complicated techniques, uh, such as AC chip calorimetry, this is actually the only technique that has, or group, I should say, that has said, we see an origin amorphous fraction TG for semiconducting polymers, right? Now, other works, and I'm not going to talk about the techniques, that's not my point here, have demonstrated a wide variety of transitions through supported DMA, uh, where we, you know, we've personally looked at the backbone TG and we see that it decreases with increasing tide chain content. Other groups have seen this alpha transition, a beta transition, somewhere near the same temperature and somewhere you know, between 100 and 200 degrees. And then other groups as well have looked at UV vis and annealing. Now what I want to do is kind of focus on some of the discrepancies within our field. Okay? So for one work, we say we have the backbone TG and RAF. Another, we say a backbone. Other says unclear. This one would say beta transition and aggregate transition. This one will call it hairy aggregates and there's no TG at all. Um, or that we have the polymer TG, but it's interesting. So if we look at this, we see, you know, about room temperature, above 100, light below room temperature. Uh, and then we have another thing that's above 100. So clearly the, the TG for these similar polymers can't be both, you know, pretty much zero and above 100. But this does actually stem something nice for us. This shows that regardless of these broad techniques, we see both a low and a high transition, regardless of what people call it, okay? And what we're going to say is that RAF is expected, and we're going to call all of these RAF despite what we're, is being reported in the literature. Because frankly, we just don't all understand quite yet what's going on. Um, but that's our goal, is to find out. And so additionally, morphological understanding is lacking. And so that's why we don't know quite what to call these upper transitions. So for this work, the reason we care about RAF is not for mechanics. It certainly has a role there. But really, it's for our charge transport. And I, I said previously, charge transport occurs in the crystalline domain. 
But polymers aren't purely crystalline. You don't have a giant single crystal where charged transport can travel. And so you have to have these bridges or tie chains that bridge crystalline domains. And they allow charged transport to go through. And they've also been shown to have a very low activation energy. And what we believe is occurring is that as the tie chain is inherently part of the raft domain, that the crystalline interaction actually stabilizes its conformation and allows it to perform charge transport effectively and potentially at high temperature. So we wanted to dive into this looking at a range of in situ techniques from wide angle x-ray scattering, device measurement. We're currently working on some FTIR, so I won't talk about it. And then spectroscopic ellipsometry. And that's the first one I'm going to talk about. And the reason for that is that we're looking at the elliptical size scale, so 100 nanometer films or less. It gives us thermal expansion, optical profile, confirmation information. But the challenge is that we have to model the data to agree with our raw data. So in our raw data, we have psi and delta. Psi is the ratio of the uh, amplitude of the polarized light, while delta is the phase change. If you look at it, you don't get much information just by looking at it. It's hard to say what's going on. So you have to model the data to extract the refractive index, the extinction coefficient, so all the optical profiles, as well as thickness. And what you get is for conjugated polymers, which have crystalline orientation, you get an ordinary, which is the in-plane, and an extraordinary signal, which is the out-of-plane. And this makes it actually more difficult. And the reason for this is we have a number of unknowns in our model. We don't know our thickness, we don't know our absorption, we don't know refractive index, and we don't know how anisotropic our film is. And so really, at every single wavelength, we have four unknowns, and then across the entire spectrum, we don't know thickness. So a lot of unknowns. And basically, even though this technique is widely applicable to thin films, it's not used extensively for conjugated polymers. So we actually overcame this a bit by performing a dual in situ measurement. So what we do is we place a film on oxide on silicon, so about a 500 nanometer oxide layer. And then we place a film on bare silicon with a native oxide layer of about, oh, 15 angstroms. And what we do is we run both experiments and then we tell our, uh, the computer that, hey, the red signal, which is from the film on the oxide, the green signal, which is the film on silicon, even though they have different substrates, the film itself is identical. So model the system appropriately as film thickness and optical profile are the same from these measurements to extract the optical profile. And this actually becomes a very robust. Uh, one of the things we do is we actually do a uniqueness measurement because with modeling, you can get a result. But the question is, does that result mean anything at all? Uh, and what we do is we tell the model, hey, Say we don't have this thickness, tell us we have another thickness. What's our error? And what we're looking for is a V-shape to say, hey, every other answer but this one gives us exceedingly high error. So we are unique in our, in our answer. And this allows us to obtain the spectra of the film. And then we do this from negative 50 to above the melting temperature in most polymers that at least melt. Um, now, I really have to thank J.A. Woolham. So when I was starting this project, Oh, it was kind of horrendous. I was basically running the measurement, but then in terms of the actual analysis, I had to pick every single data point and say, okay, these are the same. Let's fit them right now and do it separately. And to give you an idea, this is you know negative 50 to 300 degrees, about a three hour measurement, and we're measuring every two seconds. That's not fun. I didn't pick every two seconds, but uh, you know it still wasn't fun. <laughs> But the, the folks at JA Wollum were great. Uh, so they not only uh, got me up to speed on spectroscopic ellipsometry, but they also actually updated their software for me to do this all in an uh, automated fashion. So it went from spending 10 hours to analyze one thing and maybe I did it wrong and had to repeat to about 15 minutes. So it was lovely. I need to go to Nebraska and buy the guy a beer. Um, so multi-sample spectroscopic lipsometry. We've actually studied 10 polymers. Um, you see nine here. The tenth one is that P3HT. We have regiorandum and regioregular, so amorphous and semi-crystalline. But really, we're going to focus our talk on DPP-T. And so if we obtain our thickness data, the black is our uh, thickness, while red is the first derivative of the thickness. And a TG, what you'll have is you'll have a step change in the first derivative, and it allows you to extract that transition. So we actually see four transitions, and then our melting temperature, which is representative by the uh, peak. 
So just also one thing, any red lines you see I'll say now is the first derivative um, because I'll probably forget to tell you. Um, so we see two transitions within this stage two. So stage one is glassy, stage two is the mobile amorphous fraction, stage three is the rigid amorphous, rigid amorphous fraction, and stage four is melting. And so in stage two, we think we see these two transitions, and we're justifying it by the side chain has a gradient effect, right? So the side chain acts as an internal plasticizer, and so T1 would be this DPP T bond where the side chain plasticizes most extensively. And as we get to a further distance away from that side chain, we have a lessening internal plasticization of the TT bond. So that's currently what we're uh, hypothesizing. We're trying to prove it with modeling as well as FTIR analysis. Um, and then we see these two RAF transitions above 100 degrees. Uh, it's actually very nice. This T3 agrees almost perfectly with expectations from AC chip calorimetry. So we're getting very similar results, and we see this T4 as well. And we believe this also could extend from this dual uh, TG that we see in stage two. Now, this has been supported through some MD simulation by the May group, uh, where they found that the DPT bond at low temperature is quite stable. But as we increase, or excuse me, as we uh, apply, as we heat our sample, the whole unit begins to expand, crystalline anamorphous. So our pi pi stacking distance expands. And then when that happens, our DPP T bond is now able to adopt other conformations indicated by the dihedral distribution, while the TT bond is relatively stable. So it offers some proof for this, but we're still exploring it further. Now, the stages I mentioned, stage one, glassy state. So green is vitrified polymer, uh, red is the crystalline domain, and this pink is the raft domain. So you see the raft is bridging crystalline domains. We're just using it as tie chains for the moment. Uh, in stage two, we have mobilization, so the green lines turn to blue. It's pretty impressive. Um, <laughs> There's not much change in our system, right? There's not more, much morphology change that you see. In stage three, we begin to change our anisotropy. Our uh, tie chains from our raft begin to mobilize, and they begin to become bent and have increased torsion. And what we expect is a decay in charge mobility in this case, as now our charge is restricted to the crystalline domain. In stage four, we have complete melting, and we're an isotropic system. So now I've mentioned this, I need to provide something to back it up. Uh, and that's what hopefully this will do. Uh, so if we look at our optical spectra that we have obtained for DPPP, we can get a number of things. We can get the refractive index change, which is a representation of density. We can model the band gap, which is the intersection of the linear uh, extrapolation of the onset of absorption. We can look at the zero, zero peak, which represents intramolecular aggregation. And then the pi pi star transition, which represents electron delocalization. So a lot to look at. We're just going to focus on the absorption profile because it's most telling. So if we look at these transitions, we still outline it in the four regimes, so stage one, two, three, and four. For the zero, zero peak, the black curve is the uh, wavelength, so we see that it blue shifts. And the first derivative, we see the strongest uh, change in this RAF regime, uh, which would indicate a decrease in conjugation length and increased backbone torsion. In the pi pi star data, we actually see a system that is relatively stable in its first derivative. So it's basically blue shifting continuously at a similar rate. And then when we hit this RAF transition just above 125, we begin to uh, blue shift more dramatically. And what this tells us is that the length scale of electron delocalization is shortening. So it's getting smaller, which would impede charge transport. Now, if we look at our uh, optical band gap plotted as wavelength in our first derivative, we see very similar thermal transitions. And once again, these most dramatic transitions in this RAF regime that we specified through thickness. Now, due to the fact that the RAF is an interaction between the crystalline domain and amorphous, we decided to do temperature wide angle x-ray scattering to look at the crystalline domain and see what's going on. And so we have two peaks of interest, the 100 peak and the 01 peak. The 100 is the alkyl stacking direction and the 010 is the pi pi stacking direction. And what we're able to do is first look at the relative degree of crystallinity uh, plot, uh, fitted from the 100 peak. And crystallinity increases, followed by a plateau, and then a subsequent decay at the onset of melting. Um, and then for the 100 peak, we plotted d spacing. So this is basically 
the normalized expansion of our crystalline unit, so how big it's getting. And so it starts at one, we have an initial increase for both, and then in our RAF regime, this alkyl uh, stacking peak begins to increase, but more slowly, so not as rapidly. While in the pi pi stacking direction, let me give you some arrows here, the uh, pi pi stacking uh, uh, spacing begins to expand rapidly, so about 138 degrees, and what we believe is that this signals the expansion of our RAF. So additionally, with the help of our collaborators in Purdue, we were able to look at temperature-dependent charge transport. And so what I want to specifically focus on is right here for DPP once again. So charge mobility and on current. What we find is essentially a plateau right about 100 degrees and then a substance get the K about 140 lying within our RAF regime. So that's kind of our expectation. As we mobilize this RAF, we increase backbone torsion, charge transport goes down. And we also see for the threshold gate voltage that it becomes more negative, meaning that we have deepening, deepening traps within our system. So for the mobilized RAF, what we're once again expecting is that this becomes bent. I'm not a great illustrator. I couldn't draw these twisting and increased torsion, but essentially that's what we're trying to do. We're hoping to get actual um, modeling done for this system. But especially we say that there's going to be an increase in the activation energy, drop in charge transport. Now, if we plot everything we've done, so absorption profile, thickness, RDOC, mobility, what we find is that there is this vast increase in thermal expansion for thickness, we have a strong blue shifting for our wavelength, and then we have a plateau in RDOC, so no melting yet in the RAF regime, and then we have a decay in our charge mobility. And so this leads us to expect, once again, an increase in torsion in our system. Now, I've talked about DPP a lot, what about all the other 10 polymers we measured? And the awesome thing that we found is that from spectroscopic lipsometry, they all that are semi-crystalline, so all these guys, possess this RAF TG, or at least this uh, higher elevated thermal transition. Additionally, the blue, in, uh, the light blue, actually is the normal backbone TG, and it agrees quite well with other methods such as DMA. Uh, and then what we found is that this actually, this RAF transition, actually follows temperature, melting temperature quite well, which is what we expect. So as melting temperature increases, T RAF increases as well. And you can see it also on this plot. Additionally, and that's what we expect for se conventional semi-crystalline polymers. Additionally, for rigidity, it's hard to quantify this. We don't know like the persistence length of all these polymers, but we can do some qualitative assessment. For example, as we go from DPP TC4 with this alkyl breaker in it, it is not fully conjugated, it's more flexible, it has a TRAF of 119. As we go to DPP T fully conjugated, it has the uh, highest TRAF of 181, and then DPP TT goes to 228. So RAF is increasing with increasing rigidity of the backbone. Now I want to give you three special cases. So one, if we look at an amorphous domain, what's going on? So for regiorandum P3HT, if we look at its optical spectra, it's essentially just this nice gradual shift, blue shifting and decay in intensity. Uh, if we actually plot the optical band gap and the first derivative once again in uh, red, we find no RAF is present in the amorphous system, which it shouldn't be, so that's good. Uh, we have a TG of about nine degrees, which agrees with literature. And what we, we see is we would expect an increased amount of torsion as we go across this TG. And then that's why we have a rapid blue shifting. And then it basically plateaus because you're an amorphous polymer. Once you begin to increase torsion, you can only begin to, you know, basically degrade your conformation so much. Now, if we have to consider the semi-crystalline polymers that have a, a TM below its degradation temperature, such as PFFBT, this guy is actually quite flexible, a persistent length of about three nanometers, but it has a very profound change in its optical profile. And if we look at the uh, band gap, we actually find an increase in the planarity of the system. So it's actually red shifting in the band gap initially. And what we believe is actually going on, if we look at temperature wax data, it shows a strong increase in crystallinity. And so this would favor the increase in planarity. And what we find from the optical band gap is a T RAF about 162, and then a subsequent decay in our charge mobility in blue at about 200. And then for the last polymer, for DPP TT, uh, we don't see a strong decay as with PFFBT because we're not able to melt that polymer before it begins to start degrading. 
Um, but if we look at the optical band gap, there's an initial decay, so the initial blue shift. And if you look in red, it's kind of jumbled because what's happening is there's an initial blue shift when mobilization of the side chain is more prevalent and the DPPT bond. But then as we increase the higher temperature, it slows down. So you see this plateau in the first derivative. And then it speeds up again at 158 and 230. Um, so that agrees very well with our thickness data, thermal expansion. But what we see is that at 158, we have our TRAF, and then at 180, roughly, we have our decay in charge mobility. So this correlates that as we increase TRAF, we increase the onset of charge mobility decay. And we've actually done this with five polymers. I'm only showing you two, and we already discussed about DPPT. So in summary, the real cool thing here is that we demonstrated that RAF is existing in all the semiconducting polymers we measured. It appears to govern the stability of the system, which we believe is the connectivity between crystalline domains. And we developed a fun method, at least now it's fun, rather than 10 hours. That was horrible. Uh, <laughs> um, but uh, we have a method that we can do this in a facile manner now. Uh, so that covers the, the three topics we are going to cover. In summary, we looked at the role of confinement in thin films, developed a method to characterize as thin as 19 nanometer of thin film mechanics. We looked at hydrogen bonding and its role to dictate crystalline, uh, uh, crystalline packing. And then we looked at the rigid amorphous fraction and particularly demonstrating that it does appear to exist in these systems. And with that, I just want to thank you all for listening. It's been a long talk. How? 53 minutes, so it is a long talk. Uh, so thank you, Dr. Gu. Yeah, you've been a fantastic advisor. You've really given me pretty much all the opportunities I could ever ask for, and then more. I eventually, I had to tell you, no, I can't do that. <laughs> so thank you very much. You've been awesome. I also want to thank all of my committee, uh, Dr. Morgan, Dr. Azulay, Dr. Nazarenko, and Dr. Guo. I've essentially either had all of you in a class or I've actually collaborated with you. And so you've all impacted uh, my uh, study here quite substantially, so thank you for that. Um, Dr. Morgan, thank you specifically for all the help for the NRT boot camp and, uh, you know, eating the frog and all that. <laughs> uh, and some people might not know what that means. That's okay. Um, and then thank you all faculty and staff, our group especially. I've had a blast uh, working with everyone here. Uh, we're missing a couple people because they've, you know, gone off now. Uh, our outstanding collaborators. So, Please don't ask me synthesis questions. I didn't synthesize anything. I never have. <laughs> We've actually had fantastic collaborators who are experts in the synthesis of the semiconducting polymers uh, from University of Windsor to, uh, you know, out of the country in London or China or Kaust. Uh, and just great support from both our academic uh, collaborators, national labs, and our funding sources. So with that, thank you very much. Enjoy Enjoy some happy pictures of my son uh, and some fun pictures of our group. We've had a great time uh, from even during uh, COVID. We have our COVID squad of me, my wife, Kyle, and Daniel. Uh, Daniel is now in New Jersey. Kyle, you're awesome. I love you, man. Uh, and yeah, with that, I'll t happy to take any questions you might have. Great job. <laughs> so, uh, let's open some questions to entertain you. So, we start with Stephen. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay. Hey, great talk, great work. Thank you for your first. I was wondering on your uh, different side chains for hydrogen bonding. Um, you mentioned that the backbone is comparatively soft in a sense. I think you mentioned and with those who are We did not see any phase separation. So we're only incorporating those. It's one moiety in 10% of the side chains. So it's not high incorporation. One of the limits of that is these groups actually uh, lower the solubility of the system to some degree. So we actually tried to do thickness of DPPT. And what we found is that the backbone TG decreased, 
but the RAF is a little bit harder to deconvolute at the moment. And one of the reasons for that is thickness is kind of difficult. As you decrease the thickness, you don't just have a change in your amorphous response, it dictates your crystalline structure as well. And one of the things about the rigid amorphous fraction is, you know, we postulated that we have this influence of the two backbone groups, that DPPT and TT bond. Um, but there's also this idea of, you know, you have a gradient of interaction. Uh, so you're not necessarily going to have interaction, what you see, just from tie chains. You can have chains that are floating off into, you know, space that just are, you know, weakly connected. So you can kind of have a range. So currently we're still investigating that because we want to have that data, uh, but it's a bit challenging. Yeah? Uh, great job, Lee. Thanks. Awesome. Yes. How do you actually like maintain a, a shape of like, you know, like a tensile bar? Um, I'm just kind of curious because I know you have like that support. Yeah. The, yeah, so we cast them by spin casting. So they're cast onto a silicon wafer with a water soluble layer on it. And so that's a sacrificial layer. Uh, we then etch the entire uh, bilayer film with a laser. We get that dog bone. And then we basically gently, by placing a drop at the corner of that silicon wafer, it begins to dissolve that PSS water soluble layer and floats the dog bone. And so the idea is you place enough water that you don't get much of a meniscus. It's very, very flat, so it's a very thin layer, and you have a flat film. And so really, then we connect it to our, our stage where we actually shear that motion. And basically, the, the film bends as we remove the water. But that's why we purposely actually laser etch these side supports on it. And basically those take all the detrimental effect and then we just rip them off. Yeah. Great job. Um, on kind of earlier in your talk, actually like really early in like slide 15, you talked about um, if you're able to pull it up. Sure. Just to remind you what my question was, but uh, not a big deal if not. But you talked about the. This it? No, maybe one more previous 14. Uh, what, what, what was it on? It was on the so you have okay. And yes, for polystyrene. Okay. So I was just wondering, when, like, when you define your confined region or your confined zone, is that based off of like a, a thickness of the film that was smaller than the end-to-end -end distance? Yes. Like so the green is the end-to-end -end distance of polystyrene at that high molecular weight. Okay. Sure. Yes. Great question. So we uh, actually did investigate annealing. So when we spin coat polymers, you expect that there might be some residual stress that can dictate their performance. Okay. And what we found is that for the thicker films, there was no change between annealing and unnealed. So we didn't anneal them. Um, although we do have that data as well. For the thinnest films though, what we found is that when we did not anneal them, their modules decayed more rapidly. And that's uh, actually been support, um, people have found that processing can in fact uh, dictate the TG for confinement. So that's why we annealed them because we don't want it to come from the processing, we want it just from the polymer and the thickness of the polymer. Absolutely. Um, so there's kind of two answers for that. One is we actually tried to do that with y'all's DMA. We, uh, I, we got a thin film, put it on there, too thin to register. Um, we can't do it, unfortunately, with our setup. Uh, one is um, uh, just the, the current system isn't uh, able to do that. The idea is that we could. 
We could have, you know, apply temperature to a freestanding film and do it that way. It's just a little bit more complicated. But what people have done is actually drop cast the solution onto fiberglass and measure that in a DMA and get the signal from that. Um, now the problem is, is that you know you you don't get um, a you know you don't have a certain uh, geometry, right? It's just polymer within the fiberglass. Um, so you're really only just looking at tan delta. You can't really evaluate the storage modulus as much. Um, and then other groups, they do things like where they place the film on a polyimide uh, substrate and then they measure that in a DMA. Um, but really for all of these, you, you got to rely on some type of substrate. With our method, you know, if, you know, future thing, try to making a DMA would be awesome. Now this concludes the public session of the thesis defense. We're going to move on to uh, private session. Thanks. Appreciate it. It's been a great job. Hey. Good job, brother Pew. Thanks. Appreciate it. Good Thanks. Good job, buddy. Appreciate it. Really, really impressive stuff. Thanks. Yeah, that was awesome. I can only hope my dissertation looks like that. Thanks. Thanks, Brady. Thanks, Kyle. Hey. Oh, man. Appreciate it. Thanks. Hey, Scotty.